Excellent. Hello, everyone. Good evening. And I'm hoping we are streaming live onto the Organic Education Facebook page. We'll just give it a minute or two for people to join us if you're coming in. Um, and if you are there, please comment, say hello, let us know that you are watching so that we're not just speaking out into the ether. <laughs> So we can do that and you can watch it on catch up as ever here on the page. So um, my name is Alice Kimasia and I am the mother of four boys and my husband and I have been alternatively educating them for ooh, over a decade now. I can see a few people have joined us so that's wonderful. Thank you Denise for saying hi because I can see that you can see us. Appreciate that. And this evening I have the very great pleasure of being joined by Ben Porter. Welcome, Ben. Good evening. Yeah, good to be here. Yeah. Thank you so Thanks much for, for, for joining us. Yeah, Ben is a, an award-winning wildlife photographer, naturalist and researcher whose passion for the environment was greatly influenced by an upbringing on a remote Welsh island where he and his family moved in 2007 to run the island farm. Hopefully you can see the comments there as well, Ben coming up and saying yeah, hello. Hi, Alison. Hi, Jen. Yeah. Great to see you. Thanks for joining us. So I guess, Ben, you could say your experience um, gifted you a somewhat alternative upbringing and a different education from the mainstream. For sure. Yeah, you could definitely yeah. say that. <laughs> so we really look forward to hearing more from you shortly about how your passion for the natural world was nurtured by your experience growing up and how you've gone on to study conservation biology and work on some incredible projects, actually. So we're gonna hear, hear some more from Ben shortly. Um, living in a city, as I do in the urban Midlands, my soul really longs for the countryside. And I find that being cooped up inside makes me feel low sometimes. Um, and when my children were small, I realised pretty swiftly that they needed to be exercised outside daily. I used to joke that they were like dogs and needed to be outside running every day. And it's true, right? I think it's true for all of us that we need to be outside. Um, and perhaps recent periods of lockdown um, have highlighted that separation that many of us can feel from the natural world. And modern lifestyles keep us indoors a lot. Um, and sedentary too much, I think, which isn't very good for our health or our happiness, our physical and mental well-being. Um, I think generally we're a nation that are quite deficient in vitamin D. And also it's clear that there are social disparities in our access to the natural environment. Um, I read a, an alarming statistic on the Outdoor Classroom website, which said that 74% of children spend less time outdoors than the 60 minutes recommended for prison inmates. That was a statistic from 2016. Mm. And during a global environmental crisis, children are increasingly distanced from the natural world. So it's, I'm really quite passionate about encouraging parents to get their children outside and into the wild and I do believe that's really necessary to nurture a love of wildness and of the wilderness um, and naturalist Jane Goodall said the greatest danger to our future is apathy only if we understand can we care and only if we care we will help mm. um, I know that for some years when my boys were much smaller we lived in Ankara um, which is a big city in the centre of Turkey. And our lifestyle had really become very urban. Um, and my husband grew up in London, so he really is quite an urban person in many ways. Um, but living there, I, I really began to lament that my children were missing out on the experience of being in the British countryside, which I so loved and missed when we were out there. And I'd heard that unless children are immersed in the natural world before the age of 12, it will never be a real part of their soul. It will be much harder to get them to care about the environment. 
Um, and I don't know, Ben, perhaps you can say whether you agree with that. Mm. But it's interesting to think about. And I, when we returned to Britain, I was very determined to get the boys out into the countryside. And I remember they didn't really like it very much at first. They'd sort of pick their way across fields complaining about the sheep muck. And, you know, it was a bit of a, I had to kind of push them to get out there. But as they grew um, and we worked hard to embed a love for the wild in our family culture, and we spent a lot of time walking the coastal paths of Pembrokeshire um, and North Wales with them, enjoying the scenery and the wildlife. And I know that my efforts have not been in vain and they do love it. Um, they feel it, they care about it. And so I do believe passionately that children need to spend time outdoors. Um, there's a writer and filmmaker who I admire a lot called Carol Black. And she has a wonderful essay called On the Wildness of Children, in which she says, the revolution will not take place in a classroom. In wildness is the preservation of the world. And That's I love that. Cool. One, of, one, of the yeah, things I love, one of the things I love best about learning outside of school is the freedom and the flexibility we enjoy to spend more time exploring the natural world. Mm. So I'm going to hand over to Ben. And I just noticed that Fadzai has joined us and Alison and Oliver. And I'm just saying hi to you all and welcome. And I'm going to hand over to Ben. And Ben is going to give us a little introduction to himself and his upbringing and background and things mm. he's been involved in. And then we're going to have plenty of time to open up for discussion with you lovely listeners and questions. So over to you, Ben, if that's all right. Brilliant. Yeah, thanks a lot, Alice. Absolutely. Hopefully the uh, technical elements will work. Uh, it's always fun with these things. Um, yeah, fantastic. Well, um, welcome, everyone. Um, thanks for having me this evening. Really looking forward to this, actually. Um, something that's very definitely very close to my heart. Um, and, you know, a lot of the things that I do um, presently are about trying to engage people of all ages, you know, including a uh, particular passion as, you, as young people as well with the natural world and the important, as you were just saying, you know, the importance that that has. And we'll touch on that a little bit for sure um, later on. But, um, yeah, well, I'll dive I'll dive straight into sort of to I've got a, a little presentation, It'll probably be about 20, 25 minutes, sort of, I guess, giving a bit of an overview First and foremost, sort of what I'm passionate about, what I do at the moment, um, and then a bit of my story um, of getting to where I am now, but particularly the sort of emphasis on that period of um, when I was home educated on Little Island off North Wales, um, which, yeah, um, I'm looking forward to sharing with you. So I'll, I'll, I'll go for, yeah, I'll try uh, sharing the old screen now um, and head over to the presentation. So. Um, can you see that okay, Alice? Just check. Yeah, can people say in the chat if you can see Ben's slides? I wonder if I need to click something. Can someone who's listening just say yes or no? Who's there to say for me? No, not yet. Jackie says, okay. Can you see it now? That looks better, Ben. Yeah. There was a button for me to press. Can you see that now, Jackie? <laughs> No, can't see them, Denise is saying. Let's oh, wait, okay. wait, give it a minute, because I'm yeah, just, sure. just a bit of a delay. Yes, Jackie says yes, there it is. There yeah. we go. Technical Amazing, issues. thanks, guys. So, <laughs> over for the time being, touch wood. Oh, That's dear, cool. great. Brilliant. Brilliant. All right. Um, great. Well, I'll, um, yeah, I'll dive in then. So just to, yeah, I'll just start with a little bit of background of myself um, and some of the things that I do. So, yeah, my name is Ben Ben Porter. Um, I am based in North Wales um, and I spend my time, I sort of a bit of a jack of all trades within the sort of environment and ecology field, really. I sort of, um, I, at the moment, I do a lot of freelance work. So doing wildlife photography, doing surveys, doing monitoring for different organisations around Wales. Um, whilst also sort of volunteering for different organisations, doing things like sort of youth engagement with nature is one of the things that I'm really passionate about. Um, I'm currently looking to try and start up a research project that will be focusing on seabird ecology uh, north of the UK in the, in the Faroe Islands, looking at how they're interacting with sort of marine pressures, things like climate change and um, sort of offshore fish farms, wind farms, all these things that are affecting our seabird populations and looking at 
how they um, yeah how they're interacting with these. So I'm spending a lot of the winter uh, applying for research grants to get this project off the ground, and we'll see what happens with that. Um, but first and foremost, sort of underlying all of the the current sort of things that I'm involved with is a sort of real uh, passion for the natural world, really, and um, for everything from the sort of small insects and bugs and um, invertebrates through to the more you know, impressive potentially sort of birds and mammals and things and the actual habitats as well and how all of this sort of fits together really, how it's all interconnected. That's something I'm really passionate about as an ecologist. It's quite sort of holistic in terms of seeing how all these things fit together and how everything interacts. Um, and I spend a lot of my time with communication. So I believe it is incredibly important to, you know, if you're, if you're in, in, engaged in research or science, sometimes it can be really dry. And, you know, the papers that are produced, whilst maybe they have important outputs and things, sometimes they really slip by the people that maybe need to hear them or, the, you know, the general public and people who would be otherwise interested. So I believe, you know, no matter what field you're working in, I think the, the importance to, to communicate what you're finding and the importance of it is really, uh, really important. So I spend a lot of my time with sort of like science communication, whether that be through my wildlife photography or doing sort of talks a bit like this, or doing sort of short videos and things, trying to engage in the sort of more creative side, which I also absolutely love. Um, so all the images sort of through this presentation are sort of images that I've taken, and most of them, to be fair, are either on Bardsey, where I grew up, or in Wales. Um, but the, this island on the left is somewhere I've spent um, quite a bit of time recently, a small island, tiny island in the Azores, doing seabird research work for the winter with two other people, <laughs> quite an isolated spot. Um, but yeah, so this talk, I'm going to give it a bit of a, an overview of sort of my life up to this point, really sort of, um, um, yeah, sort of through my, my upbringing um, and how I got so sort of like interested in the natural world, how my upbringing on Bardsey Island affected that and what I've gone on to do since really. Um, and the sort of reflections of my experiences on Bardi through the homeschooling, because sometimes actually when you're when you're doing it, you know, as a 12, 13 year old, you're not you're not reflecting on the experience thinking mm, this is, you know, you know, afterwards, it's really uh, it's been really interesting, you know, sort of thinking back and comparing it to the other situations or home education sort of systems that I've come across it, um, since then. So for me, um, I originally am from North Wales in, in the Conway Valley, where my parents um, um, yeah, had a small cottage in the foothills of the Carnethi in, in Snowdonia. Um, so it was a really it was a really rural setting, not far um, from you know the amazing sort of mountains and forests and things of this area. Um, and so I'd always been quite surrounded by wildlife and the natural world. My dad was an outdoor pursuits instructor, instructor so spent a lot of time outdoors, you know, doing kayaking, climbing and things. And my mum works as an ecologist. Um, and so again, it's very heavily involved in the environment um, and the natural world. And I actually went to, you know, I sort of went through primary school in this area in a really small little um, primary school in the sort of rural setting out here with maybe a hundred other kids there. And I, I had a really, um, I had a really positive experience through primary school. I really enjoyed it. I had a really great bunch of friends and, you know, would go what I believe now is a sort of, you know, how kids should grow up really, you know, sort of spent so much time out in the woods playing around, making dens, you know, sort of dreaming up imaginary little worlds, constructing things out of sticks and placing acorns in places and really just, um, you know, yeah, you know, grazing your shin, falling out of trees and, all, you know, all these sort of things that at the time really took for granted. But since then in the sort of the increasingly urbanized world and the sort of disconnected world that we live in from nature it's becoming ever well and sort of health and safety labels that you know overwhelm all elements of this sort of thing it's becoming increasingly difficult to find examples of this really so i really um i really value the sort of upbringing i had in this area um and during this time growing up in the sort of conway region in north wales um we had a little hay meadow next to the house um and some of my first memories of engaging maybe with the natural world in a more conscious sense was um sort of starting to pay attention to the birds that were coming to the feeders outside our house and some of the birds that were frequenting a little hay meadow that we were restoring near the house and i remember starting to get a little a little notebook and making notes of you know identifying the garden birds that were coming and making a bit of a note of them and starting to record them and jot them down and 
mum was teaching me some of the grasses and the flowers and the hay meadow and I've still got some of these notebooks from you know the sort of earliest memories of recording the wildlife around me and that was something that was a, a really um, important part of my life following them always sort of cataloging making notes and studying nature as something that always comes down to a notebook for me you know it's such an important tool for the conservationist but that's where it sort of started for me and whilst we were living in Conway um, we spent uh, a lot of family holidays visiting a small island off the North Wales coast called Unessentially in Welsh. It means island in the tides. Um, Bardsey Island is its English name. And it's a really small little island, only a couple of kilometres long by a kilometre wide, but is it may as well be on a different planet or a different world, really. When you arrive on this island, you're straight away sort of like, there's just a different feel to the place, really, just this detachment from the mainland, different pace of life and it's got an incredible diversity of habitats and species and things that exist there. Um, and we'd always loved going here um, for family holidays. There are a number of different sort of visitor lets, these little houses, cottages on the island um, that can be rented out for a week, two weeks, three weeks, or you can even just visit the island for a day. And so we would often book out a house for, for staying for a week or two weeks. And we got to know the community living on the island. Um, and it was one of the sort of highlights of our year sometimes, you know, going to the island. And I think having this time on Bardsey, when I was starting to get into wildlife back at home, being on Bardsey, I was like absolutely blown away by just nature's just so in your face here. And it was just like, wow, like, you know, being blown away by sort of chuffs flying around and the seabirds offshore and all the flowers and the insect. So going to Bardsey was really inspiring from that point of view and really helped to sort of foster that love for the natural world that was already beginning, I feel, when I was back in Conway. And so it was partly because of our love for this island, for Bardsey Island. You can see the location of it here, just off the Thin Peninsula in North Wales, um, out in the Irish Sea. Yeah, it was sort of partly because of this, well, mostly actually, because of this love for the island, that when the opportunity came to run the island farm in 2007, um, all of us, my parents and my sister and I, were really keen to jump at this opportunity to move to the island. It's not often that a position comes up for this sort of opportunity. And yeah, the, the opportunity was to run the island farm, a sort of farming tenants. Um, and we already knew the farmer that would be employing us. We were going to be tenant farmers on the island. And we knew the people that were sort of staying on the island through the summer months. We knew the boatmen. We knew some of the other people living there. And the farmer that was employing us sort of understood that um, for him, you know, we had no farming experience ourselves, really. I mean, my dad grew up on a hill farm briefly, sort of like through his younger years. But since then, we'd had no, no involvement in livestock rearing or anything. But we just loved the place and wanted to just move there and try out this opportunity. Um, and the farmer that was employing us saw that the fact that we could get on and knew the community, knew the place, loved the place was more important when it came to it than actually knowing how to farm. You know, he said, you know, I can teach you how to farm, but I can't teach you how to get along, you know, in a small, close knit community on an island. So um, fair play to him. Um, very grateful for the opportunity that it gave us. So we moved to Bardsey in 2007 as a, as a family, upping stakes from Conway. Um, and living in a in a small house on the island, it was in October, so at the end of end of the year in the autumn that we moved. Um, and yeah, just briefly a bit of background about the island. It's it's a really important place for a whole number of different facets. It's got a a lot of different layers to it, really. One of one of which is the wildlife um, and the sort of landscape of the place. It's got really important sort of habitats and its marine ecosystem as well. Um, and sort of recognizing this, it's got all number of different designations, which basically sort of like highlight the importance of it and try to maintain those different habitats and species to you know allow them to exist and flourish really so it's a national nature reserve it's a site of special scientific interest it's a special area of conservation it's a site of, yeah special protection area for birds it's got all these different de designations basically because it's so important for its wildlife but besides the wildlife it's a really significant place spiritually going back thousands of years you know there's a there's a 13th century abbey on the island um which had monks living in it until around that time a bit later um it's got really rich archaeological record of you know it's got sort of like iron age bronze age it's got viking longhouse remains on it you know there's been um people visiting and staying on this incredible place over a period of time dating back you know thousands and thousands of years um, and so a lot of people come there because of this sort of significance spiritually, particularly the sort of links it has with Celtic Christianity um, and things like that. 
Um, and then besides that element, it's a, it's a working island. So it's, it's not just designated for its wildlife and just like sort of kept as a reserve, essentially. It's, it's a working island. So as we said, like, you know, there's, it's got farming going on. There's active fishing around the coast. Um, and it gets thousands of visitors a year that sort of stay on the island, visit for a day, um, and just come to absorb the place, really. Um, so in terms of the population, um, there's only about 10 or 15 sort of people that live there from the spring through to the autumn. And then through the winter, most people actually leave. The only full-time residents um, during the time that we were there was actually ourselves. So there's only four of us over the winter from about October, November through to March. So it's a very it's a very interesting situation where it's not sort of like a full-time community living on the island, but there is a really rich community surrounding the island who are either semi-residents through the summer or people really passionate about it and keep coming back year after year. So it's got a sort of slightly transient community, but it's a really rich place to live. Um, but also obviously quite isolating when it's just the four of you um, over the winter as well. So um, this is a picture of myself, my family and our, at the time, three dogs um, in the middle. Although I was about, I think I was about 18 or 19 there. So it wasn't when we first moved to the island. Um, so our role on the island was to manage the farm, really. We had 400 sheep, about 30 or 40 cattle. We had goats, um, we had geese and chickens. And my mum ploughed full on into sort of growing vegetables and things that for the large part would sustain us throughout the year for veggies, although we still got sort of like supermarket shops every now and then that were that came over on the boat. Um, so it's about 20 minutes on a boat to get to Bardsey and it is incredibly dependent on the weather. It's renowned, the Bardsey Sound is renowned for its tenacity with weather conditions. Um, and you can sometimes go for three weeks, four weeks through the winter without having a boat. So you become, um, yeah, the boats in the winter time with bringing like things like the posts and bringing some food fresh fruit and things like that you know it's like christmas day every time the boat comes <laughs> through the winter time so it's quite a unique position in that sense um and yeah besides the actual farming of the island my mum was working for the rspb at the time as a sort of ecologist on the island so the monitoring of the different habitats and the flowers and the species that we were trying to sort of like benefit through the different management techniques on the island. My mum was sort of on, on the side of monitoring that and then my dad was doing the more sort of like farming side and it went together really, really well working with sort of organisations like the RSPB and Natural Resources Wales to fulfil the criteria that needed to be fulfilled in terms of these different species and designated features that occur on the island. Um, and through that I also, you know, many elements of island life that i'll touch on later um as a picture yeah little picture here of our sheepdog tia rounding up a load of sheep into the yard so our house was um sort of attached to a um another one here so it's the it's the sort of one on the left hand side there um and that's where yeah that's where we lived when we were on the island um with a bit of a garden out the front a lot of the walls around the houses on the island are quite substantial because of the winds that you get um really tear anything that's standing higher than i high, higher than my height uh, get a bit battered trees aren't a dominant feature on the island it's a bit of a grainy image here but uh this is my rowing boat that i spent a lot of time in uh, when the weather was good enough, particularly in the spring and the summer, out pootling around the bay, I used to have lobster pots that I'd check. Um, one of the fishermen on the island um, really gave me lobster pots and things and encouraged me to sort of start doing this. And we often had our little border terriers out on the boat. They absolutely love these little excursions out into the bay. So yeah, after, so we moved to we moved to the island in 2007, and my parents, fair play, took on the. Um, took on the unenviable task of, um, you know, continuing the education of myself and my sister through this time. Um, there's no school on, on Bardsey anymore anyway. There used to be a population of about 150 people that lived on the island and there was a school um, where all the kids on the island um, would be educated. But when we were there, that did not exist. And so um, it wasn't a particularly difficult decision to take that it was going to be needed to do the, the home education side. So um yeah my parents decided to take on this task and after you know getting advice from various people and talking to 
um, sort of some people who had had experience in this before and some of the schools on the mainland and things, um, we decided with a sort of like a bit of a, a strategy for this. So I, I was 11 when we moved to the island. So I'd literally just finished primary school and I'd had, I think it was two months in secondary school when we moved to the island. I, rem I still remember saying to my friends on the school bus heading to secondary school that day, like, um, I'm moving to, <laughs> I'm moving to an island. Um, I'll see you later. My friends did still visit and things on the island whilst I was there, but obviously quite a different situation in terms of um, sort of relationship to, to others in terms of friends and things. I'll get onto that a bit later. Um, so what we decided with the schooling, my, my parents decided that we would do a sort of loose, like sort of structured school schedule that was still quite sort of cur curriculum led really. So um, we basically had a sort of like time schedule of doing school working hours from like sort of nine o'clock till 12 o'clock in the morning and then sort of four o'clock till six o'clock in the afternoon. Um, and this sort of schedule meant that there was still like a large amount of the afternoon and time outside of that to do whatever we wanted really you know the freedom on the arm was one of the really amazing and like incredible things to have just being able to wander all over the island um but also you know there was so much to do on the farm helping out with that all sorts of different things you know going on so we had this sort of loose structure and through um sort of gcse period um we were basically following like various textbooks and things um, you know, the basic sort of subjects, you know, sort of biology, the sciences, English, um, did Welsh um, and did choose a couple of different ones as well. So I did astronomy, which my dad did. Um, and my, my dad helped sort of like guide the maths as well. My mum's not that great at maths, but she took on a lot of the other subjects. Um, and so we followed, I guess, a sort of still a, a fairly sort of like, um, yeah, curriculum led sort of setup with the school sort of subjects and things itself it wasn't like the schooling you know was just literally you know sort of going around the island learning about things and trying to integrate the learning into being out and things it was still quite like this is school time and then this is non-school time you know it was quite structured um, and we kept up that setup through the GCSEs and A-levels as well so um, through GCSEs you know sort of did the studying some people on the island actually helped out with some of the lessons as well someone who was on the island during the summer time used to be a English teacher so she helped with some of those lessons and um quite the, the funny thing is for the exams I had to go off to the mainland and sit them in a school so we still had to be sort of registered with a school on the mainland to enable us to still do the exams over there so we just have to really hope that the weather was good enough to go and do the exams and amazingly it didn't actually miss any of the exams even though at the time a levels were still split into the sort of two sittings so you still had to do some in january which is a horrendous time to try getting off the island because of the weather but somehow we managed it so after doing the gcses um during that time i was really getting into nature the environment and understanding you know all these incredible different habitats around us the species just being fascinated by the natural world which i'll get onto in a sec and so that guided the sort of the different subjects that I chose for my A-levels. So I did environmental studies, geography and biology. And because they were subjects that I was really, really starting to get into and passionate about, um, the sort of way that the education went on from there, it ended up being towards the end quite self-motivated in a way. You know, I'd know, OK, I need to sit down and do this to, you know, to be able to get qualification for doing, you know, maybe going to university or whatever. So it did end up being quite, you know, we had textbooks and sort of files that we worked through in a, um, a sort of tutor long distance that he'd send off work to every now and then as well it was with the National Extension College for this sort of A-level element of that. Um, and that set it worked pretty well. At, at, at that point, we only got internet maybe halfway through our time on the island. Um, and obviously that was a big game changer. I can't believe I'm saying this now, you know, we had internet only halfway through, you know, it's, it's almost unthinkable living without internet right now which is insane, but we had a satellite installed, a satellite dish installed halfway through our time. I think it was about 2014. Um, and obviously after that, resources were so much more accessible. Um, and for things like A-levels and things, it did help enormously looking at videos and things and to help with some of the, the sort of concepts and the subjects and things. So I, that was a huge help um, after that. Um, and I can imagine it would probably be quite a different story again now if we were doing the whole thing again with that internet connection through things like GCSEs as well. Um, so, yeah, um, that's a sort of a bit of a just a, a sort of rough overview of the sort of how the home education side worked. Um, but obviously, 
you know, the actual subsets themselves were just a very small part of the sort of learning experience on the island, because as you can probably imagine, there was a huge amount outside of school that was so incredible to be immersed in whilst living on Bardsley Island. Um, and that spanned from obviously the sort of farming element, but also through to nature, which I'll go into a little bit more now. So as I mentioned a little while back, you know, when, when we started visiting the island before we moved there, I was really starting to get into wildlife and and just developing a bit of a curiosity, a fascination in the natural world around us. And moving to the island, that just, just, just exploded really. You know, all my spare time was spent out and about wandering around the island, looking at the birds, taking pictures of everything. Um, just, just absolutely, you know, fascinated by it all and just loving sort of finding new things, learning about it. Um, and here is just, you know, a sort of selection of some of the diversity of things that you get on the island. But basically on Bardsey, you have really amazing seabird colonies that arrive in the springtime and just fill the sea cliffs with a bustling sort of metropolis of life, really, that is really, really special. Things like puffins and Manxia water, this nocturnal seabird that only comes back to the colony at night and fills the sky with a bizarre sound all through the spring and summer. And then you have things like the red-billed chuff down here on the bottom, second in from the left, and this red-billed crow, which is really rare all across the UK and only occurs in sort of coastal locations, and Bardsey is a really important place for it. Then you have like massive migratory bird life coming through. So in spring and autumn, you have this huge passage of birds either arriving into their northern breeding grounds or leaving for, you know, their winter um, overwintering sites. And, you know, you have these days where the, the island is just thronging with bird life that's arrived as they've just come back from Africa. And there's just so much to see all around the place. Um, it's sometimes really hard to get down and do school whilst living there. Um, and besides, um, you know, besides the bird life, the insect life there, because the farming that we were doing is quite low intensive, we don't use many inputs of fertilizers or pesticides, it's virtually organic, basically, um, because we were focusing on conservation for the farming, you know, the habitats and things are so diverse that the insect life as well, you know, it's absolutely incredible. So I really got into things like moths when I was living on Bardi, as we'll find out in a minute. And through the summertime when various friends came on, we'd spend all our time just sort of like swimming in the sea, doing snorkeling and things underwater. So starting to discover this underwater realm, snorkeling with the sort of gray seals and things off the coast and spending time in kelp forest underwater, looking at the fish and things, you know, it's just a full on assault, of just, you know, wildlife and nature, um, which just, yeah, is, I think it's hard not to be just totally bowled over by it really on, on somewhere like Pardsey. But one of the things that really helped me um, as I was starting to get into nature was something called the Bardsey Bird and Field Observatory. So um, um, bird and field observatories are something that um, you get all across the UK and further afield as well, all across the world. There's a network of about 19 of these all around the sort of coast mainly of the UK. And they're basically a sort of like field study center really. So they carry out all sorts of wildlife monitoring and surveys into populations of birds, insects, plants and everything. And, and they've been going since the 1950s. In fact, Bardsey has been operational since 1953. So it's got a really rich history going back of studying the sort of wildlife and habitats on Bardsey. And the staff of the observatory arrive in the spring and then they're there through the summer doing all sorts of different fascinating work related to studying the environment on the island. And so having this literally 300 meters up the road meant that, you know, they basically very kindly sort of took me under their wing, you know, sort of like enthusiastic young person getting into nature. They gave me a moth trap to start using for monitoring the sort of insect populations. They started helping me to do things like bird ringing, um, which is where you put little metal rings on birds' legs um, and you, you know, you let them go again. And each ring has got a really unique identifiable number on them. And so where that's caught again, you can know its age, where it's where it's been um, and you can find out all sorts of interesting information about their sort of like survival um, and the sort of population level and um, sort of dynamics that are going on. So bird ringing is a really important feature of bird observatories and what they do. And so they trained me up during my time on Bards as I was getting more and more involved with their work um, and got sort of the sort of formal permits that you get really for bird ringing, which are really useful for going into conservation work later on. 
And um, one of the other really important elements of their work, as they were doing with me at the time, is youth engagement. So they still do, you know, really important places, sort of igniting that passion for wildlife. You know, people who have maybe never been exposed to these sort of things can go and stay in the bird observatory. They run sort of youth camps over there where groups of young naturalists will come over and spend a week on the island and do various activities. And some of them, having not been to these sort of places before, are so like just inspired by seeing all of this stuff and being involved and um, that you know often that enough just a week you know it's like wow right i really want to go into conservation so it's got a really important role um in sort of inspiring um and infusing young people in what's possible and what is possible as a sort of career in conservation really um and part of that is sort of mentoring as well so for we living there you know having the people both that were resident on the island at the bird observatory, but also those that were visiting. You know, you have such a diverse mix of people coming through a place like this that you learn so much from different people, whether that be related to wildlife or just generally, you know, just fascinating people from all walks of life. Um, but those that were specifically involved with the wildlife, you know, you would maybe have some people who are more passionate about sort of birding and bird watching, others who are more interested in insects and plants and things like that. So spending time with some of them and learning about identification monitoring all these different things it was a really rich experience to be able to just sort of sponge all of that up really um during the time there um here's just a few images of the sort of work that we do at the bird observatory um in the top left there is putting a ring on the leg of a, a peregrine falcon chick so there's two pairs of peregrine falcons that nest on the island and one of the um one of the main things that the bird observatory does is, is sort of like any any birds that are breeding on the island and nesting there, you know, you put rings on so that you can know which individuals come back or which individuals have, you know, sort of moved to some other place. It's a really important method. And this incredible bird in the middle is a long-eared owl, absolutely incredible bird that passes through the island. Um, the gold crest in the bottom left there, um, a friend of mine taking a bird out of a mist net. So you catch birds in these like really fine mist nets. You have to be trained to be able to do this and then carefully take them out and put these rings on their legs before letting them go. Um, so these, you know, these various activities surrounding bird ringing is something that's really important tool in conservation and was such a, both a privilege and, you know, real enjoyment to be able to learn that whilst on the island. So besides the sort of study and monitoring aspect, living, you know, on the island and running the farm, so obviously my parents taking charge of this, um, I was more, you know, very frequently enrolled into, you know, rounding up the sheep, doing all the sort of work that we needed to do that's involved in livestock, livestock husbandry, taking care of the animals and really building that sort of connection to the land, really getting to know it so intimately in a small space like that and how it changes through the seasons, how the grazing affects different areas and caring for the livestock and things as well. You know, it's a full time job working and living on a farm. There's always something to do, but it's also incredibly rewarding. Um, and growing up in this sort of setting, I learned all sorts of different things, both about the sort of habitat side, you know, linking with that interest in wildlife, but also just in sort of practical sense as well, you know, um, keeping stewardship of the land involved, you know, things like, you know, making sure the fences were in, you know, good working order, you know, putting gates in, making sure there's water for the livestock at different times of year, helping to ensure that they're appropriately sort of like wormed and vaccinated and moving them around to different places sometimes the livestock have to go off the island so there's you know there's loads of different things involved with that um, and the sort of practical skills that you learn there as well um, I'm really grateful for um, you know in that, in that situation my mum here at the bottom with uh, we had milking goats whilst we were on the, on the island for our milk and um, this is one of the newer goats at that point who was just coming onto the island so this is the the sort of livestock boat in the background there where all the sheep or the cattle or whatever had to come on the island would come on off and on using that boat so this is uh this is my mum with our our goat penny um here just about to get on the boat to come over to the island um at that point um Penny actually relocated after we left the island to a farm just down the road from here in McHuntleth in Mid Wales, which is quite funny, but I never managed to catch up with her again. I think she died last year, which is a bit sad, but there we are. <laughs> so then other aspects of island life, as I mentioned before, obviously, I guess a real consideration for someone, my sister, myself, young people growing up in such an isolated place, you know, weren't you lonely, you know, didn't you miss friends, all of these sort of things. And, you know, it's true, you know, I did, I did miss my friends to a certain extent. They did come and visit. Um, but actually, one of the really incredible things about Bardsey is that from the spring through the summer to the autumn, there's loads of different people visiting the island and they'll often come for two or three or four weeks. 
um, and we got really we yeah we really got to know some of the families that came on with their own kids um, particularly during the summer no summer months during the school holidays um, and sometimes they'd be there for four weeks so we'd spend so much time you know sort of getting to know the kids and just going out and about exploring the island doing things like swimming playing and so that social aspect was actually really um you know really present during that time you know you'd have a really busy social time during the summer and then the winter would be just complete isolation so massive contrast in the seasons but the summertime absolutely loved you know it's brilliant you know you'd be playing cards with you know friends we'd have music nights every week sometimes um and sort of the island football match every week these sort of like community events that happened um so i think being able to have that input of the sort of social aspect meant that i wasn't isolated and completely um alienated to sort of like you know if i came off the island having been there for 10 years and didn't have any of that i think i'd have probably struggled to integrate into you know whatever i went on to next but that variety of different people and things that you see um and experience when you're on the island really helped me go onwards to you know in you know interacting with people you know and, and that sort of thing um off-grid living so obviously on the island we used to run our energy by generators but latterly we had solar power and wind power to power the sort of electricity and things that we had in our house so that was a huge um sort of learning curve really you know living you know you you only put certain appliances on when the sun you know coming down in the day and charging up the battery bank you know the internet oh yeah you know put it on during the daytime but there's got to make sure that it doesn't draw too much in the evening so you're really living by the weather and the conditions and appreciating that um you know everything isn't on tap you know you know the, you know the energy comes in powers that you know we're growing vegetables in the garden you know water comes from a spring just up the hillside you really you know you very much appreciate where things come from and um you know what resources you need and where you know how much you use and things like that so it really does make you appreciate that and like i said before you know in the winter time for instance you wouldn't have fresh fruit all the time three or four weeks you know sometimes you might have a a shop that comes on with some fresh fruit and then you'd run out after a week and then you wouldn't have anything else for about three weeks so you learn to really appreciate things like that which in our modern day society globalized society you know we just take so much for granted um and it's so easy to just sort of slip back into that as well you know even you know where i'm currently now you know i take so much for granted i recognize that and actually sometimes it takes this sort of physical separation geographic separation to really you know make you wake up and realize these things so um you know it's really um yeah really enriching to sort of have that although at the same time it's a pain in pain in the butt sometimes as well you know it's not it's not all rosy and romantic you know it is it is hard at times so it's not yeah it's not worth glazing over that fact as well so then um after gcses and a levels um uh it was sort of a natural time of deciding what to do next really um and I sought advice from various people and a, specifically a lecturer at Bangor University in North Wales um, who uh, was a senior lecturer in sort of biology and really amazing, amazing sort of all round naturalist and really inspiring character that's been a really important person sort of during my more maybe professional sort of like development and career in conservation and seeking advice from him. Um, I was looking at, you know, university degrees and things that I could go on to do to start learning more about you know potentially where i could go in terms of like this field like you know conservation and nature and things um and so decided to go and do a conservation biology degree but funnily enough the lecturer at bangor recommended actually that i go and do it in falmouth <laughs> down in cornwall and uh, do a course that was with the university of exeter on their little penring campus he really thought that I would really get on well with this particular course in the area that it was in. So I'm really grateful for the advice that he gave me. So I decided to go on to this, but first I had, I guess what you might call a bit of a gap year. You know, I, I felt like I wanted to, you know, go and explore a bit and find out different things and go to different areas. And through our time on Bardsey, I'd also gotten to do a bit of work with a organization called Arosha, which is a Christian conservation organization. And they have, um, field study centers all across the world similar in nature to the Bardsey sort of the bird observatory network doing similar sort of study and things but they have like a you know, they have a Christian emphasis of sort of creation care but also a really rich community surrounding these study centers so during um during my sort of gap year I did um a few months volunteering at one of these field study centers down in Portugal 
um, learning a lot more about you know sort of studying the environment bird ringing doing these sort of things in a different context and making more connections and doing a lot of photography and sort of contributing that to the sort of um some of the campaigns and things that this center was doing i spent some time in in ecuador actually in the cloud forest where i ended up working as a, a sort of like a forest guide for about two months um and managed to cover all my expenses in sort of like tips from american tourists who were coming down to the forest to sort of see the birds and things so I, I i did a bit of exploring and sort of finding out things and i absolutely yeah it cemented my my appreciation for just absolutely loving the natural world and a real rich mix of different things that i enjoy doing from guiding through to the monitoring survey work the photography and also started to enjoy sort of presenting things to camera which is something i'll come into in a minute um so after my gap year I ended up going to study conservation biology, so a degree down in Falmouth in Cornwall um, with the University of Exeter. Um, and this transition was really interesting because at the time my parents were still living on Bardsey, so myself and funnily enough my sister, who also ended up down in Falmouth doing an art degree, we ended up living in a caravan together um, um, down there whilst I started my degree. My sister had been there a year already, um, but we ended up in the same place. Um, um, so I didn't go into halls at university. I still had this sort of distance from a real, you know, intense social situation in terms of like, I myself didn't feel like I was ready to like go on full into that sort of full on university experience at that point. So I was sort of in a caravan about four miles out of town and commuted in, but quite quickly got to know loads of different people on the course and made very, you know, very, very good friends that I'm still friends with now and do all sorts of explorations and adventures with and I overall really really enjoyed this experience at the university I absolutely loved the course I really enjoyed the area that we were in you know in Cornwall is an amazing area as I'm sure a lot of you know the coast um, and the forests and the rivers and things a lot of things that actually being able to explore again having been you know, on a little island for so long actually being able to get out into you know the mountains and forests and woodlands and things like this was really enjoyable um, and having that opportunity to connect with other like-minded people as well you know doing loads of little trips doing photography with other people learning from them and things i really enjoyed that um which is something that obviously on bardsey whilst you have a lot of interesting people coming through being amongst young people like-minded engaged in sort of like this sort of conservation photography and things like that was really really fantastic and i yeah i really appreciate the time that i had at university um and i think the the sort of this the sort of setup of education that i had on bardsey actually i i realized quite quickly that it, it sort of set me up quite well for this format of learning which i think talking to other people who were on the course they actually found quite tricky for the first year I'd sort of, because of the subjects I was doing for A-levels a on Bardsey, I, I was quite self-motivated. I knew what I sort of needed to do. So I'd sit down and sort of like figure things out and draw on various materials to do that. And I was interested in it. So I'd sort of like, yeah, make an effort to study it. And so going to university is very similar to that. You know, you have to be very self-motivated, quite um, disciplined with yourself, with time management and things. And I hadn't really fully realized at the time um, that actually, you know, coming from a homeschooling background for me actually had given me a lot of um, experience in this and actually a lot of friends found it very difficult to do these things and took a little while in their first year, you know, sort of getting to grips with this for them, quite a different format to school, um, which is really interesting. Um, so some of those aspects were quite interesting to reflect on um, going to university. And so I did um, a three year undergraduate degree there and had so many different opportunities to gain a sort of a taste of what options were available and out there sort of career wise as well and made loads of connections and contacts that I'm still in touch with now with various elements of the work that I do. Um, and just at the end of my degree, my parents actually decided that after 11 years on Bards, it was sort of time to move on really. Um, and so my last year, I remember coming back from finishing, graduating from my degree, on Bardsey and we all sort of moved off at the end of the summer had to pack up and to be fair we're only a few miles away on the mainland now so we, we still very frequently go back but at the time you know it was quite a big thing moving off the island um, and going to a more mainland sort of um, living situation but to be fair you know studying at university you know, that sort of transition to a mainland uh, life as well had sort of happened um, albeit you know with periods back home on the island as well. Um, so then 
following sort of graduating from university since then I've sort of been trying out lots of different things and starting to I guess try and figure out what exact sort of areas of conservation and and sort of like communications and things that I want to be involved with really and I've been involved in sort of like a habitat restoration project here in Wales for a year where I was working based in this town where I am now in Mokhuntla which was looking at restoring habitats and working with land landowners in the local community to join up um, sort of areas of habitats from the top of this mountain down to the sea and look at sort of sustainable land management of this region. Um, and I also started doing a bit more seabird research work. So I've spent time on various islands um, around the world um, doing things like GPS tracking of seabirds, working with uh, research teams, trying to find out where seabirds are going, how they're foraging um, and how threats at sea are affecting them. And that's what I'm going hopefully on to do next and um, potentially sort of setting up a PhD if we get the funding this winter. Um, and behind that, I've done all sorts of work for various different organizations in a sort of more freelance capacity which is something i'm more and more drifting towards now you know everything from sort of like wildlife photography through to surveys through to doing sort of like talks and um sort of elements of like engaging people with nature so be that workshops in person or things like online sort of workshops um i'm really really um passionate about inspiring people and giving the opportunity to get out in nature and both Give them the opportunity to explore themselves but also help trying to educate people about nature and show them just the wonders and the immensity of it and how it all is so interconnected and how we depend on it and how we really need to do a much better job at conserving and protecting it as well um, so all these sort of different passions i'm just trying to find outlets for really um, and I'm, I'm really enjoying it um, for sure Oh yeah, that was the slide I was meant to be uh, in the background there. Um, I think that covered pretty much everything. Um, uh, yeah. Oh, and activism. Yeah. So um, you know, since um, since leaving university, that's something that obviously with the backdrop of things like the youth strikes for climate and extinction rebellion have emerged in the last couple of years, and I got involved locally with an extinction rebellion group and started to have um, you know these first experiences for me of getting involved with sort of activism and you know hitting the streets and demonstrating and things like that which is really yeah it's been really um empowering and interesting and um it's been great to be in, in a sort of community of people so passionate about these causes and and also realizing the sort of desperation of our situation and the need to really influence government to actually enact the things that they've been saying that they should, they they have they need to do for a long time um and we'll touch on it in a minute but i've just got back from the climate conference cop 26 which I cycled up from Mokhuntleth where we are here to take part in and we'll I'm sure touch a little bit on that in a minute and sort of like reflections from that um but in terms of the sort of science communication side as well as I was saying before you know things like science can be quite dry sometimes and one of the things that I really really valued at university was coming together with a group of friends and setting up an expedition where we went and rented out a tall ship in the Arctic in Svalbard and we looked at plastic pollution around this area for a month. Um, we raised, I think it was about 40,000 we had to raise to rent out this tall ship and all the research gear that we needed to look at the issue of plastic pollution, which was at that point really becoming more apparent that it was affecting these sort of far flung places. So we wanted to do the science, but also come up, combine it with doing films and joining. We had an artist on board. We had some um, people who were sort of engaged in local community groups. Um, and so this mix of people that were on board, I was doing photography and filming myself there and we had some scientists on board. I really, really enjoyed this expedition that we sort of got off the ground. And it's something that I've sort of looked to do since just these little expeditions that sort of align with looking at different issues and engaging people who maybe otherwise might not have been interested or engaged in these issues. And I think that really important, just sparking, you know, different ways of, you know, sort of instigating these conversations and discussions that need to be had. So sort of a few reflections on like growing up on this little island here. That's the mainland in the background. I currently live or my parents currently live on a little hill here. Um, and this this was our house on the island. So, it's, you know, it's a few miles away, but it may as well be a world away, to be honest, because living on an island is it's a very different experience. Um, but yeah, for me, I, I loved homeschooling. I really enjoyed the 
I guess the freedom really, you know, being on this island and having the, the sort of free time and the ability just to go out and explore, either whether that be involved in the farming or, you know, getting to help out with the work of the bird observatory, you know, is a really nourishing and, and incredibly um, formative experience for me, for sure. Um, and, you know, there's no denying it for me, you know, the parental um, sort of, you know, the, the experience of my parents in, you know, the environment, um, whether that be the outdoor pursuits background of my dad or my, sort of my mum, who's an ecologist, you know, that that's obviously had a huge effect um, in guiding what I've gone on to do, but also just their acceptance that they didn't have any expectations of what I want, you know, what I went on to do or anything. You're very much accepting of just, you know, I'll find my own way following my passion and I'm, I'm really appreciative of that opportunity and no not having any expectations of going into a specific career path as such um and yeah in terms of the learning you know choosing the subjects that I started to have a bit more of an interest with I really valued that I mean my mum I was talking to her the other day ahead of this talk actually and she was like well I, it sort of worked at GCSE level you know you you maybe weren't that sure what you wanted to do so you know having that sort of broad outlay that sort of broad grounding of the different subjects and things as once we wanted to do and then you know after that having a bit more choice of you know what you enjoy doing and um, was what we went for and to be fair you know that sort of it worked for that time at any point anyway um and as i said before you know the sort of ability to develop a bit more independent sort of motivated learning in that situation was something that i really valued later when i went to university and um, which is closely linked again to those the sort of subjects that i'm studying that i was really enjoying and finding out more information about um you know outside of the actual school itself just gaining a deep respect and fascination for nature um is something you know obviously in this situation it's so in your face um it's almost hard not to but having said that you know living on an island isn't for everyone i think you know one of the main reasons that it worked for us was because myself and my sister we, we absolutely loved the place and being immersed in wildlife and nature and spent a lot of our spare time doing that and so you know having that interest is what meant that we could live there you know if you didn't have that interest it would be probably quite a boring place <laughs> for someone to live you know some people that come on don't really get it which um yeah is quite interesting um but we'll touch on 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 this aspect with alice in a minute in terms of the importance of that um you know exposure to nature and, and how that affects um sort of like i feel you know the ability to develop um you know um, and a, yeah, an awareness for you know the need to care and protect what is around us. Um, you yeah, um, and then yeah, sort of appreciation of living simply, really, and within what I I've put down here, planetary means, because you know it is very much apparent that you know our current lifestyles just aren't really sustainable. You know we 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 have um, you know carbon footprints as if there were six or seven planets, and you know in reality. There's only one, and and in this situation on Bardsey, it was really amazing to you know be able to just rely on solar power and wind power, try and grow as much of our own veg as possible. Meat was at that point. I'm now vegetarian, but meat was from the island, so it's you know about as sustainable as you get. Um, and you know the fishing that went on around the island, these sort of like localization of supply chains whilst yeah, obviously we still got things from the supermarket and stuff, but it certainly gave you a, a sort of taste to what it maybe looks like to live a bit more simply um, in that respect. Um, and community, you know, community is so important. I can't stress that enough. And at that point, there are various communities that I was involved with, you know, both on the island, sort of physically there, but also, you know, I connected with other like-minded birders and sort of naturalists online once we got the internet and met up with people periodically on the mainland, little group get-togethers, and that was another sort of community. Um, but, you know, the importance of having other like-minded people around you that you can you know both share your struggles your challenges and your highlights with that can you know encourage you and inspire you when things are maybe a little bit tough or you know that sort of thing I, I think we'll come on to this in a minute but i think that's vital in this sort of this current sort of like um situation that we face is particularly with things like climate anxiety as well mm. um yeah so that was probably ended up being a little bit longer than uh, it needs to be, but um, yeah, thanks for listening. And I'll I'll, I'll stop. Sh oh yeah, I hope you you like the picture of the grey seal and the sea firm. It's very relevant for the current storm that's coming through today. Um, but yeah, thanks for listening. And um, I'll stop sharing screen now, and we can go on to um, yeah, go on to some some questions. Yeah, thank you so much, Ben. It's brilliant just to hear your enthusiasm for your 
uh, alternative education there and and it always just really makes me smile when i see people who are able to just be living in their passion and find ways to pursue that as they move into adult life um and it's it's brilliant the way that your parents kind of allowed you that mm. freedom and encouraged those interests that they could see developing in you and what an incredible experience to have shared as a family um and there's a few people saying how lovely it's been to hear your experience but they don't have yeah. questions we did have a few questions that came in ahead of time that's right um, yeah so perhaps we can just have a quick look at those um victoria asks um what would you recommend young nature lovers do to explore possible careers in nature um i think you you have kind of touched on these things in what you've said um she says i'd love to help her experience some sort of work experience in different settings to help her get an idea of what she might like in the future. Um, it was interesting that you mentioned Arosha because I actually um, took my boys on a um, a sort of working holiday with Arosha. Um, it was on the Gower and we, um, we did a week with them and it was really great, again, to be in a small community and exploring that part of the coast. Um, and we had an ecologist who came onto site and took us on guided walks and introduced us to, um, you know, creatures that we encountered and plants. Um, and the boys absolutely loved that. Um, and what you were saying about the bird observatory and that mentorship and the opportunities that that gave you. Is there anything else you'd add in answer to Victoria's question? Yeah, I mean, you know, similar along those lines, there's loads of great organisations that now have really good structures for engaging young people, actually, because in conservation, you know, it, it can be quite a difficult field to get into. And unfortunately, there is often a, a thing where, you know, you have to have had like, you know, maybe years of experience, you know, volunteering and, you know, that in itself is quite exclusive in terms of when we're talking about inclusivity and diversity, you know, straight away that, you know, the, the conservation sector is, is the, I believe it's the second least diverse sector in the UK, um, which is shocking. So uh, I was just talking to someone yesterday about the sort of, you know, the work that they do about trying to, you know, really try and make this a lot more inclusive and diverse. Um, but yeah, there's loads of other amazing organisations. I just recommend, you know, getting a feel for what's in your local area is probably really important. So it's accessible in terms of, you know, not too far away. There are loads of little nature reserves. So the Wildlife Trust is a great, great one. RSPB is another one. But Wildlife Trust have lots of regional little nature reserves where you can go and get practical hands-on experience. You can help out in all sorts of a really great activities. Same with the RSPB um there's things like more niche so there's like the butterfly conservation trust there's the bat conservation trust there's loads of great ngos that are there that you know if you get in touch with them you know there is definitely opportunities for having young people go and you know get experience and link up with others in these sort of fields sometimes they'll even have dedicated sort of like clubs and you know youth you know youth groups that can get involved so it's um you know that that is definitely where i would send people to sort of find out about that really yeah, brilliant. There's, a, I mean, the Wildlife Trust have been quite a feature of uh, my boys' education with yeah. various events and clubs that they've been able to be part of. And um, I think most people can find a Wildlife Trust not too far away. Um, and yeah, I think uh, one of my boys did a work experience placement actually at one of our local nature reserves as well, where he got to spend time with local rangers and um, get involved in some of the work that they were doing um so yeah it's good just to be aware isn't it and keep your eyes out for different opportunities if your child's got an interest um yeah. of that kind uh oh someone's asking is, is yeah. do you feel your degree was essential um, kind of work? i i don't think it is essential like it's it's good for some positions and especially if you go down the academic route it's often quite prescribed that you know for this you need a master's for this you need a phd you know you need all these things but there's loads of different ways of getting into conservation it's actually quite amazing how many different routes that you can get into different lines of work with and actually sometimes the sort of practical experience and knowing different people and having those sort of contacts where you maybe have developed a relationship with over time they can sometimes be more valuable than actually than a degree actually um some of the things that i do now i i don't think that having a degree necessarily the actual paper bit of it anyway has maybe would have an effect of whether i had some of the jobs and work that i've had now or not i actually think that just um 
you know, seeing opportunities out there, trying for them, you know, obviously not being, trying not to be afraid, you know, you're going to get rejections, you're going to fail at, at some points, but, you know, saying yes to things, trying different things, and then the sort of contacts and the things you learn along the way, you know, um, yeah, I, I think there's lots of different routes, you don't necessarily need a university degree. Mm, that's interesting isn't it that often networking is really yeah. quite key and um, sure. yeah it was interesting that you emphasized the importance of community when I'm sure one of the questions people would have wanted to ask you uh, was about the kind of isolated nature of the mm. island so the fact that that was one of the real positive um, parts of your time there was that's an interesting point mm. uh, and it's interesting too that you had a year out to kind of explore different possibilities and travel and because um, sometimes that can give us ideas too, can't it, about the way in which we might want to move um, yeah, yeah, before investing in that degree. Yeah. yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah, I found that. I found it very useful. Just I love. Yeah, I really love exploring and adventures. And I think, you know, having that opportunity after being, you know, on a little tiny island for 10 or 11 years I was like, ah, it would be quite nice to go and explore a bit. So, you know, having that opportunity. But you know in retrospect you know especially in current you know traveling is great and things but actually you know there's some amazing stuff on our doorstep here in the uk and you know amazing projects that are going on as well that i was like oh wow you know that i know of now that probably if i had a gap year, i'd probably actually go to those out of choice actually in the uk and get to know more about our local um yeah sort of local you know what's going on in the, in the uk that can sort of support yeah it's brilliant i think one of the other lovely things about your story is the way that you're very rooted Ben in in a place that you feel a sense of connection and belonging to and I think often in our modern world we're all quite uh, displaced in a way especially you know those of us that have come into urban centres um, I wonder if you can say anything to that like that sense of belonging and yeah yeah it's definitely like you know that question of what you know what is home to you as well is a really interesting one because obviously I spent a certain amount of time on the mainland in North Wales before we went to the island but I would say the place that I feel most at home and rooted to is Bardsey um even though since then I no longer live there technically um and I've spent varying degrees of time you know down at university you you build up a bit of a you know a bit of sort of roots in places like that and where I currently am in mid Wales I really connect with the community here and really love um some of the elements of this place here and I really enjoy it here I feel like you know I've got a sort of certain amount of roots here but I think um yeah I think the connection to the to the place and to the landscape is so strong on Bardsey and um, that that is a place that I will continue to return to and just you sort of like it's something about an island and that particular place in itself um that you know, a lot of people feel actually, you know, when you talk to people that have been to Bardsey, um, you know, they feel just so, yeah, when you step on, you know, a lot of people, they find all that, you know, like the sort of the stresses and anxieties of sort of mainland life and things just sort of melt away um, as they sort of step onto the island. And we'd felt that visiting the island and um, living there is interestingly a little bit different sometimes because you've got so much to do. You don't get to just sit there and be like, oh, this is really nice, just relax, you know. You just don't get that when you live there, but you still feel that, that you know, yeah, there's roots there. Um, so, yeah. yeah I, think, I think that sense of being rooted and being in a place, that connection means that we care about mm. places in a way yeah. that perhaps we lose yeah. when we're kind of more displaced into into urban centers so that's just really interesting we loved yeah. visiting Bardsey and um yeah, course, yeah. my, my my strong memory is of arriving on the boat and as we came in hearing the seal singing yeah, yeah what a wonderful amazing, haunting man. sound that I haven't really yeah. experienced that before and my son referred to Bardsey as it's like the edge of the world that's um, a great really is a, a special place yeah. yeah, we were going to talk a little bit, weren't we? I'm aware that our time has flown yes. by then. Um, perhaps just before we wrap up, we could just yeah. talk a little bit for people about um, helping children with climate yeah. anxiety. Um, yeah. And I know that some people are perhaps a little wary of introducing their children to um, the kind of fears around the climate crisis and, and, and how to engage with children about that. And yeah. um, and I was talking to you a little bit before we came on live about the importance of moving through through that grief that we feel 
to yeah. a place of empowerment where we we feel we can take action um because yeah. our grief is about our love right we we grieve exactly. because we love um yeah. and so kind of enabling and empowering children to to face that and move through it to a place of um action is there anything that you would say to parents yeah, about absolutely. that absolutely i think yeah i think some of those things that you said there are really important because like um i think one of the worst things is that feeling of um hope like helplessness of like not being able to do anything about you know it is such an enormous issue that we're facing you know it is huge um and sometimes it can feel, you know, what, what, you know, what hope have we got? You know, what could we do about it? But actually, um, partly coming back to sort of community again in terms of like having those, you know, for instance, the youth strikes, you know, the sort of connection of, of, of young people all across the world who are coming together, striking to try and demand, you know, greater action um, from, you know, higher level from government um, for climate action. That feeling of solidarity across the globe of young people coming together that sort of community is so um so sustaining for like for me in my current position in terms of like you know i still suffer from sort of like you know anxiety about the situation that we're in but the things that help me for that is knowing that there are other people so engaged in these issues doing things and i know that they are going to do as much as they can to do it and every now and then you'll have a gathering of you know all these different people from all parts of the world coming together and sharing these stories of you know the struggles but also the really, you know, the sort of positives where, you know, there have been breakthroughs, um, whether that be, you know, things where government have, you know, set more ambitious targets or at a local level, even, you know, small wins like that. And I think um, having these little things, um, whatever level that, you know, young people can be engaged with, um, is really important to have that outlet, that sort of, that either practical outlet or sort of like something that can be doing that's contributing to it. Um, and having others around you maybe that are also doing similar things to be able to support in that, I think, um, is really important. Um, and in terms of the climate emergency as well, because nature is obviously so integral to this whole thing, you know, so you can't address the climate emergency without addressing the biodiversity crisis. Um, and so that connection to nature, again, you know, if you're able to help, you know, wildlife in your local area, you're doing something about the climate emergency as well. Um, so you know there's these sort of elements i think as well um but you know it is it is a tricky one it's tough you know it is um you know i can't imagine that sort of you know that realization of like wow <laughs> this is the situation we're in you know it's it's a big one it's a heavy it's a heavy heavy thing to take on so it is yeah it's a tricky one to navigate yeah i think you're right for me too getting involved in things and taking action corporately being yeah. linked up with other like-minded people is very empowering isn't it and i think um also, I love on your Instagram channel when you share the conservation good news because I think mm. too, often we can look so long at the negative images and stories, yeah, yeah, can't we? Yeah, and yet, yeah. if we if we shift our gaze and find yeah. all the good news stories that are going yeah. on and all exactly. the people that are taking action and doing things, that can really make us feel much more empowered. So I've sure. put Ben's Instagram and Twitter handles into the chat there so that Brilliant. you can all follow him along too and. Um, Feel, feel more encouraged in that. Or oh, someone's like, <laughs> how do we get a child over a fear of dogs? You grew up with yeah. dogs, man. We do have dogs. Yeah, well, we did. Yeah, no, I, yeah, that's an interesting one. I guess it depends, depends on the dog, depends on the attitude of the dog. Some dogs I'm afraid of, <laughs> I think, you know, but it depends on the experience I think, you know, kids have had with different yeah. dogs. If, uh, if they can have a good experience with, some very nice dogs and, and and generally you know introduce that i think that definitely helps with confidence in that respect but i've definitely have dogs that i'm also quite afraid of myself sometimes a healthy wariness might be quite a good thing yeah though, exactly I yeah I don't know. thank you i we, it's quarter past nine and i've <laughs> you kept you longer than i said i would so i very much appreciate you coming and sharing your story and i'm sure people have enjoyed hearing from you and there might well be other questions that come into the page yeah. then I don't know if you're well, able to kind of check in over the next few days and just... yeah yeah and if I haven't answered them then um, do, yeah let me know because I'm sometimes not always like I do a lot on sort of Instagram and, and and Twitter but I'll try and have a look at the Facebook page otherwise just message me and say oh there's some you know these questions and I'll be questions. glad to, um, to answer them for sure yeah yeah it's really great just to hear from different people's experiences of, of alternative educational mm. backgrounds and upbringings and to see what what you've gone on to is really inspiring so thank you so much for your time and no thank worries. you all of you that have 
have joined us live and um yeah look forward to seeing you again soon brilliant yeah really great to be here yeah thanks a lot take care thanks, thanks. all right bye